the nature of the evolutionary process that gave rise to Neanderthals has been debated for decades. A key issue is whether that Neanderthalization process affected all regions of the skull at once, or if there were different stages in this process that affected different regions of the skull at various times. The Neanderthalization process refers to the gradual acquisition of Neanderthal traits or characteristics by populations over time. It is based on the concept of accretion, which suggests that these traits were added to the genetic makeup of humans through evolutionary adaptations, and possibly through gene flow from other populations. Neanderthals would never win a beauty contest, and now that their skulls have been scanned, it is clear that their robust faces, complete with wide noses, long skulls, and large eyes, were not even cold-weather adaptations. In fact, recent research indicates that Neanderthals' peculiar faces were adaptations to warm environments. New explanations regarding Neanderthal anatomy seek to resolve the paradox that some of their traits are not cold adapted. Due to the Pleistocene glaciation, also known as the Ice Ages, the Earth continually swung from frigid glacial periods to warmer interglacials. The period from 300 to 130,000 years ago spans the penultimate glacial period, and the permafrost zone may have stretched far south into Eurasia. According to one theory, genetic drift appears to have been a significant factor in their evolution, in addition to climatic adaptations and an increase in encephalization. The most likely explanation for the fixation of Neanderthal characteristics so far appears to be an accretion of features since a clear, speciation event has not been documented. According to the accretion model of Neanderthal evolution, populations in Europe gradually accumulated distinctive morphological traits, which allowed this subgroup of late Pleistocene hominids to develop in either partial or complete genetic isolation from the rest of humanity. The model claims that as these traits became more prevalent, they also became less variable. Its proponents contend that genetic drift, the result of an initial small European population and either total isolation or a sharp decline in gene flow between this crop and other modern human populations, caused this evolution. Moreover, multiple human lineages coexisted during the late Middle and late Pleistocene, which produced a diverse biogeographic environment for human evolution. These paleoenvironments were diverse, ranging from the Gobi Desert to tropical rainforest from coastal plains to the Tibet Plateau, and from the steppes of Europe to savannas of East Africa and the deserts of the Middle East. However, evidence points to a common ancestor or lineage of Neanderthals, Denisovans, and modern humans. This common ancestor likely lived between 600,000 and 750,000 years ago, according to DNA evidence. The Neanderthals originated from one branch that migrated to western Eurasia. The other branch relocated to eastern Eurasia and became Denisovan. The modern humans, Homo sapiens, originated from those who migrated to Africa, in accordance with the last common ancestor being in Eurasia. Nonetheless, evidence from the Middle Pleistocene assemblages has emphasized the impossibility of aligning, in a chronological sequence, of the primitive and derived traits of Middle Pleistocene populations. To be specific, studies revealed that pre-Neanderthal fossils, dated to approximately 420,000 years ago, were more Neanderthal not only than classic Neanderthal populations, but also more Neanderthals than some Neanderthal themselves. Thus, the evidence is not supportive of the hypothesis that earlier Neanderthal specimens would show basal or primitive Neanderthal morphology, while the later ones would exhibit full-blown, classic or derived, Neanderthal anatomy. In terms of morphology, ancient human fossils are sometimes referred to as Neanderthaloid, that have large Neanderthal-like features such as large brow ridges, large eye sockets and low-vaulted, elongated brain cases. For example, the carboy cranium and other skulls from Africa are sometimes referred to as an African Neanderthals, and the Java man skulls from Indonesia are sometimes referred to as Eastern Neanderthals. Meanwhile, Neanderthals from the Levant are sometimes referred to as warm Neanderthals, while the classic European Neanderthals are referred to as cold Neanderthals. For example, compared to European Neanderthals, Levantine Neanderthals had phenotypes that were noticeably closer to those of modern humans. This could be as a result of gene flow from early modern humans living in the Levantine Corridor, or the fact that the European Neanderthal phenotype is a highly specialized climatic adaptation. It was hypothesized that since Neanderthals inhabited regions with colder climates, such as Europe and parts of Asia, during the Pleistocene epoch, a large nose could have played a role in warming and humidifying the cold, 
dry air thereby reducing the risk of respiratory issues, such as dryness or irritation of the nasal passages. The increased surface area within the nasal cavity, facilitated by a larger nose, would have allowed for better heat and moisture exchange between inhaled air and the respiratory system, improving overall respiratory function. The large nasal cavities in Neanderthals might have aided in filtering airborne particles and impurities. The ample space within the nasal passage could have accommodated a more extensive network of nose hair, enhancing the filtration process. This adaptation would have been beneficial for Neanderthals living in environments with high levels of dust, pollutants, or other airborne irritants. The size of the nasal aperture could have played a role in thermoregulation, particularly in a species inhabiting regions with diverse climates. The larger opening would have provided a greater surface area for heat exchange with the environment. In colder environments, the larger nasal aperture might have helped to warm the cold air before it reached the respiratory system, minimizing heat loss. Yet, in warmer climates, the increased nasal surface area could have facilitated evaporative cooling as air passed over the moist nasal membranes. By increasing the surface area exposed to the external environment, the large apertures could have facilitated heat dissipation through convection or evaporation, helping to regulate body temperature in hot climates. You can see these adaptations in many African specimens such as the Carbway and Bodo skulls. However, another potential explanation for larger noses in Neanderthals relates to oxygen intake. The increased size of the nasal passages could have allowed for a greater volume of inhaled air, maximizing oxygen intake. This adaptation might have been advantageous for Neanderthals engaged in physically demanding activities, such as hunting or gathering, which required significant energy expenditure. The size of the nasal aperture could have also influenced vocalization capabilities and communication strategies. A larger nasal aperture might have allowed for greater resonance and amplification of vocalizations, enabling more effective communication within the species. This adaptation could have been particularly relevant in social contexts, such as group coordination during hunting or warning signals to conspecifics. The Neanderthal skull's large nasal apertures might also suggest an emphasis on olfactory abilities. If the population relied heavily on their sense of smell for locating food, detecting predators, or navigating their environment, the larger nasal apertures would have provided more space for an increased number of olfactory receptors. This adaptation would have allowed for enhanced olfactory sensitivity and discrimination, aiding the species in identifying scents associated with food sources, mating partners, or potential dangers. Indeed, Neanderthals inhabited different ecological niches during the Pleistocene era including regions of Europe and Western Asia. These areas posed various challenges, such as dense forests, caves, and high latitudes with limited sunlight. Therefore, it was hypothesized that Neanderthals evolved larger eyes compared to modern humans to maximize visual sensitivity in low-light conditions. In such environments, having larger eyes could have provided them with a competitive advantage by enabling better detection of prey, predators, or other members of their social groups. Yet, once again we can also see very large eyes in specimens from Africa including Bodo and Carbway. The ecological context in which the Neanderthal species inhabited could have influenced the size of the eye sockets. For example, if a species lived in open grassland steppe or grassland environments, having larger eyes and eye sockets could have been advantageous for scanning wide expanses, and detecting potential threats or resources from a distance. Another factor to consider is Neanderthals' hunting strategies. Studies suggest that they primarily engaged in close-range hunting, requiring accurate depth perception. Larger eyes would have provided improved binocular vision, enabling them to accurately judge distances and effectively hunt prey. Alternatively, if they inhabited dense forests, larger eyes would have been beneficial for navigating through complex vegetation and identifying objects or organisms in shadowed areas. Additionally, Neanderthals are known to have engaged in complex social behaviors and likely relied heavily on nonverbal communication for survival. Having larger eyes may have facilitated communication through enhanced visual cues, enabling better recognition of facial expressions, gestures, and body language among group members. In point of fact, it is well known that many animal species, cats for example, have eyesight that is much better than humans. Seeing in the dark, seeing fine detail, and also better hand-eye coordination are associated with better eyesight, which is not necessarily the size of the eyes but more associated with brain function and the biology of the eyes. 
However, today only the most well-trained athletes have advanced visual coordination, but ancient humans most likely had the visual muscular coordination of wild animals, which was lost when humans became self-domesticated and did not need to survive alone in the wild. Neanderthals and other early humans had eyes that were at least 20% larger, and brain areas for visual processing that were also 20% larger than modern humans, but does that mean they also had better vision? Furthermore, most of our hominin ancestors have the superorbital torus, also known as the brow ridge, which is a very distinctive morphological trait. What function does this aspect serve? One of the theories surrounding this issue, is that the large size may have been sexually selected over generations due to a signaling effect that emphasizes aggressive stares. Yet, Neanderthal man has a brow ridge that is much larger than what is necessary to meet spatial requirements, and its size has little bearing on mechanical performance when biting. In fact, a large number of skulls with large superorbital tori are hollowed inside, including carbway, indicating that they did not transmit or bear physical forces from blows to the head or vigorous chewing. As stated, Neanderthals inhabited Europe's heavily forested regions, while Homo sapiens lived on open grassland plains. Savanna grasslands and forested terrain are very different types of environments. When comparing Neanderthals to Homo sapiens, it is already known that Neanderthals have shorter legs, especially in the tibia and fibula leg bones below the knee. Leg length is thought to have decreased as a result of Neanderthal adaptation to the colder climates of Europe. The evidence for other adaptations which Neanderthals were better suited for in Europe's cold, dense forests is supported by their shorter legs. Long toes are one of the adaptations Neanderthals made for the cold climates of Europe between 300,000 and 40,000 years ago. In addition to having longer toes than Homo sapiens, Neanderthals also have longer heel bones. Thus, as evidenced by their longer toes and longer heel bones, Neanderthal anatomy is better suited for the cold climates of Europe because it made them well suited for hiking, hunting, and even sprinting in the hilly and forested environments that Europe had to offer. Yet, the hypothesis for their large eyes and noses being a cold weather adaptation is not supported by evidence. Based on these findings, scientists propose a source and sink model, where the variability of the fossil hominin samples in early and middle Pleistocene Europe was explained as a result of repeated population dispersals, fragmentation, and recombination of surviving populations inside Europe. The driving force behind this demographic patterning would be the climatic fluctuations which would also define the windows of opportunity for immigration episodes from Southwest Asia. Source populations would have lived in those parts of Southern Europe where hominins could have survived glacial periods. Whereas, the sink populations would have been in those areas in higher latitudes that were only suitable for occupation in warm interglacials. Furthermore, these sink populations would often have depended upon source populations to maintain a stable populations. However, when environmental conditions deteriorated, many sink populations would have become extinct and or retreated to a southern refuge where they would have mixed with the resident groups. This recombination would explain the high morphological variability maintained by European populations throughout the Middle Pleistocene, despite the demographic decline. In fact, in another peer-reviewed paper, scientists suggest that a multidirectional shuttle dispersal model is more likely to explain the complex phylogenetic connections among African and Eurasian hominin species and populations. According to the study, sympatric diversification and founder event dispersal are the most dominant biogeographical modes, reflecting the fact that multilineages of humans coexisted in Africa, Europe and Asia during the Middle and Late Pleistocene. These lineages probably had a strong capability of dispersing for long distances, but remained in relatively small and isolated populations. Indeed, biogeographical stochastic mapping indicates that the directionality of the dispersals between Africa, Asia and Europe is asymmetric. Africa is the major source of dispersals, and Asia is a sink of hominin species and receives more dispersals from Africa and Europe than it gives dispersals to Africa and Europe, according to the researchers. It is important to note that this hypothesis is speculative as the specific environmental context and physiological adaptations of the skull are not well documented. The proposed explanations draw upon general principles of adaptation and ecological considerations, but would require further research to provide more definitive answers. 
Nonetheless, these findings support the idea that Neanderthals were very smart, but not quite in the same league as Homo sapiens. That difference, which was related to their morphology, might have been enough to tip the balance when things were beginning to get tough at the end of the last ice age, and Neanderthals found themselves isolated and dying. Please check out all our other videos on human evolution and continue to explore the mysteries of our shared past. Until then, remember to embrace the uniqueness of our shared human heritage. Thank you for watching.